Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Demon Land podcast. Uh, my name is Andy, and joining me as co-host this week, uh, you might know him on Twitter as at Demon Blog. He's the author of The Great Depression, and he writes a very lengthy but always entertaining blog each week, which you can find at demonblog.com. He's known on Demon Land as Super Mercado. Super welcome to the uh, Demon Land podcast. Thank you for having me. That makes it sound like I've got quite the identity crisis. I'm operating under a lot of <laughs> yes, pseudonyms. I think you need to sort of, uh, you know, just bundle it all up into just uh, one one name. So uh, Consolidate. Well, we'll see if I'm ever uh, forced into the witness protection program for what's <laughs> written in the blog. I'm, I'm through uh, 13, 13 seasons without being sued so far, so just keep on rolling and hope I don't have to change my name. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, joining us shortly will be James Harms. But firstly, um, wow, um, it almost happened again. Um, what's that Britney Spears song? Uh, Oops, I did it again. Um, were you nervous um, going into, well, not going into that last quarter, in the last quarter? No, no, I was nervous going into that last quarter. I can uh, I can assure you that my, my wife, the, the lovely Mrs. Demon blog, uh, came into the room at three-quarter time, asked the traditional question, are you winning? Yes, I get uh, that many times. Yeah. And I said, yes. But. Uh, and then she was there, well, I'm off to bed, see you later. And I said, if you hear loud noises and commotion in the other room, it's likely that we're throwing the game away again. Uh, and suffice to say that she and the neighbours uh, both heard me wailing and thrashing about a lot in the last quarter and then at the end you know general shouts of triumph and actually quite literally uh, squealing when bets hit that hit the post well uh, you mentioned uh, bets hitting the post when when I was watching I actually thought he kicked the goal because I'd sort of averted my eyes as he was running in because I knew how could how could he possibly miss that um you know uh, I could have kicked a blindfold. <laughs> yeah. and, well, uh, there was also that one earlier in the quarter where the guy went for a snap around the corner and kicked it straight up in the air in the square. So we were certainly uh, certainly lucky. Uh, I saw the bets one because I went to spin around because I always stand up in front of my TV. I, I can't sit down during games. And I sort of went to spin around and go, ah, and land back on my couch. Unfortunately, I spun in the direction of the television. <laughs> so as I went around, I saw it hit the post and then continued my circle and, and landed comfortably on the couch and got up and went again. I mean, even after he missed that, I thought, oh, we'll probably kick it out straight to them. Yeah. I just, you know, I'm so scarred. So I'm just yep. thinking so negatively, especially in that situation. Um, I'm like you, for most of the game, I can sit down. But when it's, you know, last quarter, it's getting close. I can't sit down. I'm pacing back and forth. Um, another heart stopper. Um yeah, it would be nice to just just get a, a comfortable one, uh, and I'm certainly without taking anything for granted, hoping that this week we can at least at least win without uh, the possibility of putting away several of our our more elderly fans. Well, you obviously haven't been following the demons for very long. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm hoping <laughs> that's the most important thing. Well, um, we're going to be. Um, I think we're going to take a break, quick break now. We're going to uh, bring on uh, James Harms in a moment. Uh, we'll be back in a moment. Long kick inside 50. Harms! <laughs> that was a ripper from Harms. Look at that outstanding jump. Just threw himself at the contest. Good leap. And that's a really good mark. Grew up a Melbourne fan. Always wanted to wear the demon colours. And he kicks their second. Brayshaw, centering bomb. Vince is under it. Harms! Oh! Mate, it is. He's looked like a likely forward at different times. A couple of uh, good overhead marks. You'll hear the crowd go up. Every single one of them. The start of an exciting career for James Harms, just his eighth game. Well, that was um, that was 54 games ago, and um, it's been a long time uh, since then. And um, our guest tonight has played now, played 62 games for the Demons since making his debut in 2015. Uh, during that time, he's lined up in about just about every position on the ground you can get a name with stints down back, up forward, on the ball, short stints in the ruck. 
and has now been a revelation as a run with player over the past two weeks. Uh, welcome back to the uh, Demon Land podcast, James Harms. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. Been a throwback there to DWS a few years ago. That's right. Uh, that was a great game. Um, James, uh, we mentioned in the intro that you've been a revelation in the past few weeks with, uh, as a go-to uh, run with player. Um You've been tasked with curtailing arguably some of the best midfielders in the league in Dangerfield, Selwood, Sloan. Uh, what was going through your head when you got word from Goody uh, that that would be your role? Um, not a whole lot, really. I just yeah, focused on pretty much keeping them out of the game. Um, didn't really worry about getting the ball too much. And, um, you know, just had a really defensive mindset going into the game and um, you know when you play on good players like that you got to stay switched on the whole time because you give them a little bit of room and they um, they take a while so um, yeah this mindset was just you know try and play my role for the team and um, yeah probably feel like I've done that the last couple of weeks. James I've always been fascinated about the process of what we call tagging uh, when you sort of go to someone uh, from the first bounce do you sort of go up to them and, and, and sort of say, you know, hi, I'm James, I'll be following you around tonight? Or do you sort of just go up and let them work out that you're going to be the one following them around? Yeah, I kind of, um, I just go up to them. Sal got straight into me because he must have known that I was coming to him. Um, and then Sloan was pretty good. He, yeah, he's not a bad fella. So uh, I just go up and I think they work out pretty quick when I'm all over him to stop him that. Um, I'm going to be with him for the day. Is there like an international language of you just like a bit of a jostle or something that they know this bloke means business? Um, oh, I just try and be physical, um, you know, work to my strengths and um, try, usually try and push him into the contest and get him into the, uh, you know, the hustle and bustle in there so they don't get on the outside of James, have you had past experience uh, in ta- in the tagging role? Uh, is that something that you've you've had to sort of learn on the on the fly, or um, you know, have you, how's the experience with that been? Yeah, I haven't done a lot of the, uh, tagging in my career. Uh, I did a little bit in the VFL just before I got selected to play my first game, actually. So uh, I was doing a few run with, run with roles, but other than that, nah something I've probably, you know, had to learn over the last few weeks and you know, it's pretty, it's not too hard to just go and watch the vision and, um, you know, watch previous taggers on them and see what they do. So as, as we mentioned earlier, you've been, you've done a few roles. One I, one I was quite uh, excited to see earlier this year was when you had a stint as the centre bounce Ruckman. Uh, how, could you tell us how that came about? Do you sort of get the nod in the week before the game saying you're it or is it more sort of on the day? Uh, that came about, yeah, I remember we had a meeting the day before a game uh, and Goody told me that I would take centre bounce when Max is off and uh, Petraka would take the ball ups around the ground. So, um, yeah, they warned us beforehand, but definitely not keen on getting back in the ruck. It's <laughs> definitely well, the I, big boys, I, not for little fellas. I've got good news for you. My mum, who is a very irregular uh, attendee to the games, she was just happened to be taking photos that day, and she took a photo of your first centre bounce hit out. So if you ever want to frame oh, that on your wall and remember yeah, remember the day, the uh, we, we've got the picture. Show <laughs> <laughs> uh, James, uh, I thought you did an excellent job uh, in keeping Sloan to 17 possessions, and then you know, impressively racking up 23 of your own. How do you find the balance between, like, keeping your eye on the player that you're minding, but then also finding the ball yourself? Yeah, Sloan's a really good player. Um, he might have had just a bit of a quiet night, I reckon, but I actually only tagged him for the first half, so um, we dropped the tag in the second half to try and get me into the game a bit more because we were getting beaten around the ball. Um, so... Uh, that was a little bit of a different one. Probably, I haven't had a lot of roles where I've probably in the first half I was pretty quiet, and then I got off on got off in the second half. But um, probably something I need to learn is to you know win my own ball when I am tagging. So definitely something I probably can add to you know my game. And of course, you're probably in a way lucky to even be playing the game, um, considering the the injury to your hand 
uh, in the game against the Cats and the fact you had to have surgery after that. Uh, in that case, it make it even more impressive um, that you're able to play such a part in the victory. How's the hand going now, and does it, it does it feel as good as a hand that's just had surgery a week ago can be? Yeah, I was a little bit touch and go there for a while. Um, obviously, had surgery last Monday um, just to repair the third metacarpal in the uh, in the hand. Um, and yeah, it's credit to the, uh, the physios and the doctor down at Melbourne. Um, they backed me in, and you know, we got all the work done in the week and. I didn't really do anything for the first part of the week and then um, pretty much just played the game. So, um, yeah, the hand pulled up not too bad. It's been a little bit sore the last couple of days, but, for, you know, nine days post-surgery is pretty good, back to full function and um, just got to yeah, watch the swelling. So, yeah. Just don't get bitten by a dog. That, yeah, that's that, that, that cost a week. This I've didn't only, cost a week. I've only got a little sausage dog, so she, she's <laughs> all right. She won't bite me. Um, uh, James, uh, it was an amazing win on Saturday night, but early in the game, we found ourselves three goals down. You know, we're away from home with a very vocal crowd. What was the message at, at quarter time? Uh, yeah, we're, we're probably lacking, uh, you know, our contested area. You know, we, we pride ourselves on being a, a really good contested ball team, and um, to Adelaide's credit, they probably they served it up to us. and um, got on top of us in the first quarter, and Goody just said, "Stay calm, um, keep grinding away, and, and we'll eventually grind them down, and um, you know, turn the tide a little bit." You know. And as you said, the Adelaide crowd they do play a big part in um, you know the results usually. So it was great to get the win down there. Um, it's a really great win for not only the team but for the whole football club. And moving forward, we can build some confidence off that win and hopefully take it into the next few weeks. So when you find yourself on the back foot early, how is the belief in the playing group that you can that you can turn things around? Yeah, it's very high. We we definitely know what we, what we're capable of, and um, as I said, we're probably just a little bit off of our uh, you know contested ball work, um, and that's you know if that's not if we don't bring that on game day, then um, teams will probably beat us. So when that's down, we're probably you know going to be behind a few goals but when we get that back up and running we're pretty hard to beat now you mentioned the uh, the Adelaide crowd um I think another thing I've always always wanted to ask a player is and you've just had two weeks in hostile environments uh do you get that feeling that you're in enemy territory uh when you're playing those games interstate or in Geelong yeah definitely you do um I love it I'll, it kind of makes you go a bit harder and um, you know, when the crowd's doing there, it kind of fires me up. And I, I think it does for a lot of the other boys. So, um, you know, as much as we love playing at the G, I don't mind having, you know, support of opposition supporters doing us because it really gets me going. It really fires me up. And we've certainly had a good record uh, at the Adelaide Oval or as good a record uh, as we've had there, certainly in Adelaide, because we didn't win a game there for about 15 years before the, before the Adelaide Oval opened. Uh, do you get a lot of... What, what we would call verbals over the boundary line from the uh, the interstate crowds? Yeah, we always cop a little bit. Um, it's not too bad. I mean, you're always going to cop a bit, but, um, yeah, here and there we cop it a bit. It's all, all pretty, uh, you know, bit of fun and games. Um, James, obviously the result in Geelong was devastating to the playing group. Uh, for us supporters, it stung. And, like, personally for me, it took me almost the whole week to recover. Um, how long do you guys wallow in that before you have to sort of pick yourselves up and prepare for the next game? Yeah, obviously, we're pretty disappointed after that game, you know, losing on the siren. Um, I think that's twice we've lost to them this year by, you know, less than a goal. So, um, yeah, it's pretty devastating. But uh, just after the game, you know, we reflect have a quick review on it, um, come into Monday and, you know, we try and get our review done and then we move on to next week. So, you know, as much as it hurts, we learn from it and then, yeah, we go again the next week. Um, as fans, many of us uh, got the sense this week uh, that it was, oh, no, not again uh, during that last quarter against the Crows. How mindful uh, were you and the playing group of not letting that happen again and, were there lessons that you learned from the week before that prepared you for that? Yeah, definitely. We definitely learned a lot of lessons. Um, probably just more of our structure and how we set up, you know, when games are tight and all the little things count. So, you know, holding the ball in rather than, um, 
dishing it out and letting them get a bit of run on. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough one sometimes when you you know you lose by a couple of points, but we definitely learnt from it, and hopefully the supporters and yourself could have seen on the weekend that we um, you know we put everything into action and um, held on with the win. If we can go back to a couple of memorable games uh, during your career and get your thoughts, uh, one was late in 2015 against Collingwood where you kick what proved to be the sealer uh, in the last quarter. Um, as a Melbourne supporter, what was it like to sink the pies with uh, your first career goal? Yeah, it was pretty good. I actually came on as a sub. Um, remember that. So I was feeling pretty feeling pretty fresh, um, running around like a headless chook for a little while there, um, trying to get a kick. But no, nah, it was unreal. Um, as you said, growing up as a, as a Melbourne supporter, you dream as a kid to kick a goal for the club that you grow up at 83 for And, um, you know, when I finally got to do that, it was, yeah, pretty special. The second game that comes to mind is against the Gold Coast uh, the next year, uh, still very early in your career. And, you you know, you played a fantastic game, especially in the first quarter. How does it feel to get on a roll like that uh, when you've got the likes of uh, Gary Ablett on the other side? Yeah, I did. I think I had 15 in the first quarter of that game. Um, most of it I had in the quarter. So, um, yeah, oh, I just remember I was playing on the wing and I felt like it was one of those days where the ball just kept falling in my lap, to be honest with you. Um, you know, to play against Gary Ablett, he's probably going to go down as one of the greatest of all time. You, know, you kind of pinch yourself every time you're out there next to him. So, um, yeah, it's, it's great, great fun playing next to him. And, um, yeah, as I said, you kind of pinch yourself. Well, you must pinch yourself uh, playing playing with the likes of uh, Maxi Gorn and uh, Clary Oliver. Um, at the moment, they're, they're just killing it. Yeah, absolutely. Big Maxi's bloody dominating. And um, young Claz, he's already a star. And you know, it's pretty exciting to think about you know, what he's going to be like in three or four years' time when he gets a bit older and more mature. But at the moment, geez, he's uh, playing some good footy. Oh, he, he definitely is. Um, James, uh, it's a favourite pastime of us fans to go through all the possible permutations with uh, the ladder predictors to see um, what stars need to align for us to make the finals. How aware are the players of all those calculations needed? Or is it just a simple matter of just going out there and if we win, then we're in? Uh, I'm not really too sure on the, the calculations and whatnot, so I'm not sure about the other boys, but um, at the moment, yeah, I guess, I know it's one of those common cliches that you hear every week, but, you know, there's four weeks left and, um, you know, we'll probably just take it week by week and try and, um, you know, get as many wins as we can. Um, you know, it's a really important match this week against Gold Coast. Um, you know, it's a bit of a danger match, so... We've got to go out there and play the same way as we did the last few weeks. And I'm sure if we do that, then we'll, uh, we'll go a long way to winning. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, our destiny is in our, in our own hands. Um, you know, we just uh, good luck to you and the boys and bring it home for us. Um, James, thank you once again uh, for joining us on the Demonland podcast. We really appreciate your time. And uh, as I said, good luck for the rest of the season. Thanks, Al. Thank you heaps for having me. Not a problem. Thank you. Cheers. That was uh, that was James Harms uh, joining us uh, on the Demon Lamb podcast, and we thank uh, James and the Footy Club for for generously uh, giving us their time. All right, welcome back uh, to the Demon Lamb podcast. Uh, it's been uh, a comedy of errors, uh, kind of like uh, the D's uh, circa. What, what year would you say that was circa? Uh, Oh, I'd say my performance with the microphone there was a uh, Mark Neal era 2012, early 2013 <laughs> style debacle. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, yeah, we just had some microphone issues, uh, but, we're, but we're back um, and hopefully firing on all cylinders. Uh, thank you for uh, bearing with us. If you're still listening, if you're listening to this on a repeat, well, you missed all the fun. <laughs> Um, we, we hope you be, there's a generic, uh, generous editing to be done. This reminds me of uh, the times I used to call Finey's final siren uh, back in the day. Uh, I rang up once to defend the honour of Brad Green after we beat Essendon uh, in 2011, I think, and I, I rang up once to defend the honour of Stephen Martin when we beat Brisbane in early 2011. So I think that was actually my last ever call to SEN. So 
it really rem- it's having a telephone to my ear speaking about footy really brings back some great memories of uh, ringing up the radio and saying stupid things. Well, I hope you're uh, talking on a rotary uh, phone. <laughs> Uh, oh, I'm just hoping to. I'm just hoping the next caller on the line is Chris from Campbell. <laughs> well, in case uh, you couldn't tell the difference, uh, that the, we, I am still talking to uh, my co-host Super Mercado. Uh, he's had to get on the uh, the old landline. Well, I think you are on a mobile, but uh, we'll call it a landline, um, uh, which means we won't be able to take any other calls. Well, we. I probably could, but it would probably end up hanging up on you. Um, someone can try calling if you want. Zero uh, three nine zero one six three triple six. That's zero three nine zero one six three triple six. Or you can give us a call on uh, Demonland thirty one. Uh, what I might do is while we're just talking here, I might see if I can. What happens <clears throat> if I sign in on my other computer? Um, under the the Demonland Thirty One account and see what happens. Um, I'm not sure whether you can have. It's, two it's a it. shame I got the uh, I got my microphone committed Harry Carry halfway through that interview because I really wanted to ask uh, James what it was like to be a sub back in the day because he, he mentioned that that Collingwood game he came on as a sub. I really wanted to know like what was the what was the process they went through and what did it feel like just to sort of sit there watching the game for for three quarters waiting to be uh, to be given a chance. So i have to ask him that next time. Yeah, well, uh, considering we've had him on uh, twice in two months, uh, probably sometime uh, in October we could be speaking to James. We could invite him into a real sort of lights out segment at the end where he you know, pulls up a, a random picture on Demon Wiki or something as well. Yeah, and I apologise for the Skype calls. Uh, Skype is the bane of my existence at the moment. Um, they have changed everything. I hate Microsoft. They've uh, it, it, bigger shambles than the, your microphone issues at the moment. Oh, uh, I'm glad it's only in the top two. Yeah, because there is no way to turn off the Skype sounds um, anymore. Um, so <laughs> you're likely to hear sounds like you just heard uh, going off if someone tries to call. Someone did actually try to call, but... It would have, what it would have done if I'd answered it, it would have put you on hold while I talked to them and that's just not going to work. But I have I have opened Skype on the other computer, so if uh, that caller would like to call back, we'll try and get you on um, in a moment. So, yeah, give us a call back. Um, but while we're waiting for that, uh, we haven't really talked about the game. We talked about our emotions in the last quarter, but um, let's talk about the game. Um how were, how were you feeling? How were you feeling early on? Uh, we were twenty points down before we even got on the scoreboard. Uh, were you ready to? Um, there was, was there any wrist slashing almost going to happen? Um, I, I certainly we've thought. We've, out of, go ahead. We've pulled out of a hole of three or four goals so many times in the last few years to at least give ourselves a chance. And, um, the and, record is very much still in favour of losses. And in, in Adelaide as well. And in Adelaide as well, we did it. Um, Correct. Um, and I was hoping this time we might also yeah, plough onto a seven-goal win after we did that. Uh, but, look, I was worried because in that situation, you're always, you know, two minutes, of ma- two minutes more of madness away from being five goals down um, and in an enormous hole. Um, but I, I did want to hold on and just wait before I before I totally lost the plot. And, I, and look, I thought we were very lucky to only be nine points down at quarter time, um, but that's what gave us the, the second life. Uh, and then we, we weathered a sort of a, a dud five minutes at the start of the second quarter as well uh, and stayed within range. And then, for, again, third quarter for the third week in a row went bananas uh, and set up, set up the margin that we uh, successfully built a fort and defended. Uh, yeah, um, that third quarter was uh, that was great. Um, seven goals. It seems like, the, and there was a thread on Demonland this week about our third quarters. I think we've won fourteen uh, this year, and we've lost a couple by just a few points. Um, but I just love those seven goal quarters. Um, we really turned it on. Um, I, one well, it's, it's game changing. Uh, yeah, a third quarter blast like that is game changing. Like in the first quarter, 
there's a lot of times, probably not of seven goals, there's a lot of times we've kicked four or five goals in a first quarter and then, you know, one goal in the second quarter. And I know we sort of did that this time, but the, la- the, the gap was, the time was enough. The time versus the points margin was just enough to, to keep us afloat. So it's, it's very important. Better in the last quarter, obviously, but the third quarter is so important to get a break there as well. So if we're going to be great in any quarter... I'd rather it be the last, but I'm very much happy for it to be the third as well. <laughs> um, that last quarter, so the rain the rain came down. Uh, did you, I mean, what was your thinking at the time? Did you think the rain would help us? Did you think that would work against us? And did it help or work against us? Oh, look, I don't think we've shown much aptitude for, for playing in the wet um, over the last the last couple of years, but I guess it did allow us to turn it into a uh, a bit of a stoppage slog, um, which was you know good a good way for us to run down the clock. I saw Max Gorman had the he equaled his own record for the most hit outs yep. uh, ever in a Melbourne game of the Hawthorne game earlier this year. So if there's anyone who likes playing in the rain, ironically, it might be the the tallest bloke on the team. <laughs> and he just uh, Max. I did, Max just just keeps you know getting. Uh, it seems like he's getting better and better. Um, I'm sure you would have seen the stat this week with, uh, and I think it's been going for a while. Um, his hit outs to advantage that um, he is beating every other team players in each individual team combined. Um, I think he's had 303 or something. Um, Hit outs to advantage, and I think the next uh, the next team is quite well down on two forty four. Um, it's just remarkable. And the, and the last team, last team in the comp, which was the Bulldogs, was about three times less. Yeah, hundred and seven. Than he's had just on his own, <laughs> and I think that's the that shows the difference between a great ruckman and just an ordinary ruckman. Because let's not forget, it's not just the taps with Max. Um, I actually thought he looked a bit tired in the first the first half last week, but that might be just armchair armchair viewing uh, with no with no real uh, science behind it. Um, and there wasn't that, that the marks sort of floats through the back line or floats through the forward line. But that's what you get with Max Gorn, that a lot of ruckman, like you could put someone out there to have 66 taps in a game. But there were times in that game this week where he was just like an extra midfielder. You know, yeah. people kick it to his feet. And despite being a giraffe-like stature... He's straight down, picks it up, delivers it. His disposal for a ruckman is as good as you're going to get, balancing the the fact that he's also a great a tap ruckman. Um, it's just, to me, that's the difference between a great ruckman and just a good ruckman. If you're going to have a good ruckman, they've got to be able to, to play around to, to compensate for that. Yes, he's a caller. Thank you. Toki hands for all. Um, so I think that that's really important uh, that, that, yeah, you get that. If you're not going to have the great Ruckman, you may as well just throw anyone in there who can who can jump. You may as well bring your James Harms of the world up and say, bad luck, you're taking the centre bounces um, because you can do stuff around the ground as well. There's, there's just no point now having someone who's only a good tap Ruckman and nothing else. Yeah. Uh, caller, uh, you're on the air. How are you going? Yeah, boys, how you going? Yeah, not too bad. Who are we talking to? Uh, my name's Alex. I'm actually uh, I'm not a Demon Land member, but that's all right. Just re- just recently started listening to your podcast. Oh, thank you very much. Um, well, it doesn't matter that you're not a Demon Land member. We're always happy to hear from our listeners. Um, I am a uh, big footy member, so I'm one of those assholes. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, my friend uh, who is a Demon Land member put you put me onto your guys' podcast a few months ago, so I've been listening since then. Oh, thanks, mate. Uh, well, I hope you're, hope you're enjoying it. Uh, we're certainly not uh, experts on it. Uh, we're just like every other mug, uh, you know, watch the game and, you know, sometimes uh, yeah. we all agree with each other, other times we don't. Um, yeah. What do you, you think of the game on the weekend? Oh, I thought it was, um, I thought it was a really good fight back. I thought they were, they were underdone when they went there after that Geelong loss. And then to be 20 points down and then to come back and, you know, really kind of hold on at the end there was exactly what we wanted them to do the week before. Uh, so it's all pluses from here, you know. Um, I thought it was great. 
Were you uh, were you nervous uh, in that last quarter? Did you think oh, it was yeah. going to be oh, a mate, repeat? I was like you guys. I was yelling at the TV. I was jumping up and down like <laughs> a little kid. <laughs> and then when the, the siren did go, I kind of did a little fist pump like I was actually on the ground, like I just won the game myself. So um, I was very nervous there. But uh, all good. Focus on Gold Coast this week. We know that these games are the danger games oh, for yes. us. And, <laughs> Yeah, no, it's this. It's uh, as um, Demon Blog puts it. It's the uh, post-traumatic stress of being a Demon supporter, and um, you, you just got to take the good and uh, week by week. And hopefully, we just have a nice, easy win this week and look to, look forward to Sydney. Yeah, well, um, I, I don't like getting ahead of myself. Uh, I know we should beat uh, Gold Coast, um, but. No, I don't want to just beat them. If we are going to beat them, I I, I think we need to start. We need to consolidate that uh, percentage. Obviously, I'll take the win over anything. But uh, yeah, we're uh, and we'll talk about it a bit later. Uh, uh, Super Mercado, uh, but percentage uh, is going to be important considering uh, a couple of the teams that we're competing with had big wins last weekend and sort of closing that percentage gap. Are you talking to me, sorry? Oh, oh yeah. Sorry, oh, I was talking, talking to Super Carter. I, I'm, uh, <laughs> I, I, no, no, I'm just wondering if when uh, when I took your call, whether it just put Super Mercado on no. hold. No, you there? Uh, oh, I'm here if you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> I just wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's lucky, lucky it's not the first time you've listened because uh, due to my technological issues tonight, you would have run a mile. So uh, the, well, the, the views uh, of my microphone do not represent those of Demon Land. Well, I was actually just lis- listening and you said, oh, we'll get a caller. So I called the landline and then I come back and it's like, oh, we can't take landline calls. So I'm like, fuck, I haven't used Skype in. Oh, did it, s- did it say that? Did it say you can't take landline calls? No, no, because after I called the landline, it came back to the app. And oh, it yes. It and you were saying that you can't take landline calls. So I haven't used Skype since like 2003 or no, something. What, what, so it, I- <laughs> what did it, what it actually happen? I, I know the feeling. What, it, what has actually happened is because... Because uh, Super Mercado had his issues with his uh, microphone, he called in on our regular our call-in line. Um, so I wasn't sure what would happen if someone called in while he was on that line, whether it would boot him off or not. So anyway, it's all worked out. Uh, the I only... probably deserved a, a stint in the sin bin after, uh, <laughs> after bringing technological shenanigans to the program. So apologies again to all the all the listeners. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just pissed Apology off. Apology accepted. I'm just pissed off that that <laughs> Skype you. provides no way in this new software to mute the sounds of the call coming in. They've got no thought uh, for people who are trying to host a podcast. I, I have been reading up on other software, which uh, which is better for podcasts, and I'll have to sort of teach my co-hosts how to use these things in the coming weeks. But that's all behind the scenes stuff. I'll be it. I'll be at JB buying another microphone after <laughs> I've held this one over my back. Then. Uh, well, you know, you know what? Uh, maybe uh, maybe Demon Land can pass the hat around and see if we can uh, get you a decent uh, <laughs> headset. Um, is there anything else, uh, Alex? Uh, you want to uh, anything else you want to bring up? Yeah. Um, what do you boys reckon about Jakey Melksham missing this week with a hammy and uh, Hibo and? Viney kind of looking like they're not tracking to come back until maybe even end of uh, end of the season, round twenty three. Well, well, the the Melksham one, um, they've they've said that it's um, it's a minor hamstring. Um, so minor in Melbourne terms is what four to six weeks. <laughs> yeah, at least. <laughs> um, no, well, hopefully that's one to two weeks. Um, I don't know, but it seems Hibbard, for the last two or two weeks, he's been two to three weeks, and he's still saying on the injury list two to three weeks. So when you when four to six. He, yeah, that's right. It's a, we've when, always, when your team might not have four to six games left, they go down to two to three. Yeah, exactly. So hmm, I don't know what's happening there. Viney is the really worrying one. Uh, because apparently he hasn't even started running yet, so I can't see him coming back uh, before the end of uh, the home and away season. Uh, Super Mercado? Yeah, I'm not factoring him in, to be honest, to before the end of the season. Um, I'm hoping that we, we go long enough that we can uh, work him back in eventually, uh, especially if 
we make the finals and you've got that extra extra week break. Um, potentially, if we can unleash him in a in a final, uh, that wouldn't be a bad in between round twenty three and a final. There's a massive out, massive out. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. Just, just. I mean, uh, losing those three. If, if we if we take the Melksham thing on on face value, that it's only a a one week injury, even losing having those three out is three just no drama. Best twenty two players. Oh, um, easy. Yeah. And you know, I don't I don't want to buy into it's only Gold Coast because never give a sucker and even break. Um, yeah. But as long as we can get Melksham back. Because, um, as I said a few weeks ago on the show, I think he's the most underrated Kegler going anywhere this year. And I think he's a, so I think I think really he's a sneaky chance for back. Australian, honestly. Who, Jakey Milksham? Yeah, yeah. He's gone for something like over 60% for inside 50s, uh, you know, delivering inside 50. Uh, he's a decent goal kicker. He's a he's a decent utility forward and mid. Uh, he can play any position, and his ball use is elite. So I think he's a sneaky yeah. chance, maybe 40-man squad. If not, maybe interchange. I th- I, th- I think his his last few weeks have or have been or his second half of the year has been a lot quieter than the first half. But I agree with everything you say, though. Every time he gets the ball, it's elite. Um, yeah. So and, that, and that's why if we give him the ball more, which is easier, you know, that's a pretty simplistic thing to say. But I think it's it, when we play through him, we're a much more dangerous attacking unit. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, it's it's going to be a crazy, crazy uh, month, really. I think if we can bank Gold Coast and then hopefully beat Sydney, uh, I reckon that those last two games are uh, up for grabs, you know, West Coast and uh, GWS. I think we could beat West Coast over there. I'm not too impressed with West Coast, to tell you the truth. Yeah, neither um, am I. I would love to get. I'd love to get the next two wins. I don't want to yeah. say. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'd like to sort of bank those two and I'd be breathing a lot easier. Um, and then I think, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, West Coast are beatable, um, yep. but I wouldn't want to have to bank the, our getting in on the finals on having to win that game. I'm going to go out on all in. I'm say we're going to bank the next two, and then we're going to beat West Coast. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Well, we're, we're... I'd like to move the West Coast game to Hobart because if last <laughs> week's game was anything to go by, West Coast, uh, I wouldn't be bothered turning up. I knew that they were going to lose that game. I was so confident. If I was more of a betting man, I would have uh, put <laughs> money, a lot of money on, on uh, that, uh, that yep. occurrence. It's 11-1 for Gold Coast to win this week, so maybe that's a punt. Uh, you know what? It, 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 I'm, a, I'm a scarred Melbourne supporter. If you've listened to this podcast at all, you you know that. So I never this. It reminds me of the Brisbane game last year a little bit. Um, yep. We really needed to bank percentage in that game, and we nearly even lost that game. If you yeah. remember, yep. um, yeah. Well, I think the line is sixty-seven and a half. I'm told by the gambling community. So wow. uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that wouldn't be a bad bet, considering. Yes, we need to bank the percentage, but we probably also need to uh, put a bit of, you know, rest in in the last quarter if we get too far, if we've got too much of a buffer, they might rest a few of the, the key players who have looked a bit tired recently. So I'd be yeah. pretty much satisfied if we won by 67 points. Yeah, and, and look, percentage percentage isn't as a bigger factor this year as it is last year. Um, yeah, Yet, <laughs> we, uh, that's what I want to sort of bank some now. So in case we have a big loss down the track, um, that it, it doesn't uh, doesn't damage us too much. Um, yeah. Well, that um, St Kilda game they dropped this year, off the top of my head, I think they were fourteen to one to to uh, St Kilda was to win. Oh, really? Lost that. <laughs> yeah. So that's massive. I can't believe they. <clears throat> I can't believe they'd be a bigger outsider than Gold Coast. So well. I just, it's, oh, they're pretty bad, and we it lost. It just couldn't so. happen. But <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, like you say, we've we've seen too much. I need a couple of I think flags in the tank before I'm going to go into any game any time. Convinced oh, yeah. we're going to win. I mean no, that that you loss can't, you can't do that. that loss to St Kilda is is killing us because had we won that game and a win this week. Probably would have sealed us uh, into into the finals. Uh, yeah. yeah, yep. 
and yeah. then we could have breathed I a mean, lot easier. I mean, everyone's got their yes. Geelong yeah. lost to the Bulldogs, yeah. Hawthorne lost to Brisbane twice. Like, they, yeah, this is where, you know, when you're an idiot like me and do ladder predictors from about round seven <laughs> and try and predict it, predict the rest of the season from then, um, there's, there's basically no point doing it because teams are going to go out and lose ridiculous games that they shouldn't lose. Um, and I very much hope that, that St Kilda was our contribution to that for this year um, and that the game we absolutely should win this week, uh, we do. And then we treat the last three weeks as should start favourites against Sydney, will start underdogs against the Eagles and then GWS, that could go anywhere um, in the next four weeks. They're three games that are, are much closer to 50-50 than this week. I don't even want to contemplate uh, what's going to happen if we don't win this week. <laughs> How many people do you reckon would have shown up this week if we'd lost to Adelaide? Oh, oh, as in, uh, I reckon we could have gone under 10,000. As in uh, turned up to the, to the game this week? Yeah, I, I reckon if we'd lost to Adelaide last week, GW, uh, Gold Coast will bring about 150 fans. <laughs> I reckon we could have challenged that GWS game at Etihad Stadium a few years ago where we... Uh, Smash the record for the lowest ever crowd at Eddie Had Stadium. I reckon we could have gone for a similar uh, at the MCG. But now, everyone's pumped after the Adelaide game, and I would suspect we would get what passes for a decent crowd against the Suns. Well, there was a thread on Demon Land this week about whether people thought we would beat the previous um, uh, highest crowd for a Melbourne Gold Coast game, which I believe was... Uh, it was twenty seven thousand something a couple years ago. Round, uh, round one. Yeah. Do you think we? Uh, we sh- do you think we'll top thirty? No, I, I, I remember I don't being think at so. a um, Melbourne GWS game. I think in I, I can't remember if it was two thousand thirteen. I think there was only eight thousand people there. Yeah, that was that was the, the one at Eddie had Stadium in the last round, our home game. So <coughs> yeah, that that had yeah. all the factors. Our home game at Eddie had Stadium. In the last round, after a season where we'd got better, but we were going nowhere, uh, and just the fact that it was the last round, so people couldn't be bothered anymore. And I think it was Father's Day as well, <laughs> and, and, and we, we managed it, to yeah pull. We 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 beat it by about three thousand the previous low at uh, Eddie Head Stadium, uh, but we we wrecked the uh, the hoodoo on that day, which often gets forgotten. That was the day we put the Eddie Head Stadium hoodoo to rest. I'm thinking about one at the MCG where we actually lost to GWS and it was the last game of the round. Oh, yeah. I remember that well. No, I think I think that was that a little was bit worse. more. Um, I remember that game that they actually would... I think they were down to one player on the bench in the last quarter and still one running away. Uh, yeah, that was so... the first and last time in my life I've ever been warned by a security guard about my conduct. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we always seem to get into depression talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love it. Oh, it has been the last 10 years, hasn't it? Oh, yes, it, it is. Uh, and if you want to read about uh, our, our depression years, uh, my uh, friend uh, Super Mercado uh, does have a book out called The Great Depression, uh, which, you can, which you can get where, uh, Super Mercado? You may as well give it a plug. Well, you can go to demonblog.com. Uh, you can also get it on uh, Kindle on the Amazon store, um, and uh, I believe it's been uh, banned in several states due to the uh, the psychological impact it's having on the readers. Uh, no, I do I do read the Demon Blog, so I, I enjoy that every week. It's like a look into my own mind with better language. So <laughs> <laughs> keep yeah, putting yeah, those yeah, out there; really pain. enjoyable. Um, anything else, Alex? Uh... No. No, no, just a shout out to uh, Johnny Raff, uh, who put me onto your podcast. And uh, thanks, boys, and keep it up, and I'll speak to you soon. All right, not a problem. Thank you for joining the show, and, uh, yeah, give us a call uh, another week. No All right, see you, boys. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was, uh, that was uh, Alex uh, joining us, not a Demon Land member, but you don't have to be a Demon Land member, you have to be a Demon fan, and uh, that's uh, what we all are. We're all in the same asylum uh, together on this, uh, on this journey. Uh, We've got each other for comfort. That's what that we do. Um, I, I wanted to bring up, it was uh, Jordy Lewis's uh, 300th game. I thought he had a, had a ripper, uh, kicked two cracking goals, almost identical to each other. Um, I, I like, uh, Jordan Lewis kicking goals. Uh, 
I mean, playing in defen- deep in defence, sort of as he does, he doesn't really get there. But that that was nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. As far as goals go, it, it kind of just ranked below that Carlton one last year, where we rorted the uh, we rorted the clock in the last few seconds uh, to to run the clock down, and then I think he kicked might have kicked the goal after the siren just to, to add an exclamation mark on the game. But, uh, yeah, they were certainly... I think the first one, perhaps, was the second goal of our was. our first two when we were in the hole. So came at a came at a very opportune time. Look, I agree. I, I've been critical of him on this program and previously on the blog, but I thought he had, a, he had an excellent game. So if you can't, uh, you know, if you can't celebrate your 300th with a win and an excellent game, uh, well, I guess I wouldn't know because we've only ever had one 300th. <laughs> yeah. And well, we I, lost I, suspect it, he, I suspect he's only the second player to ever play their 300th game for us in any in any capacity. So, I, so we haven't got much to work on. I saw a statistic of uh, players that had pl- either played against us or for us um, for their 300th game. I think it was a list. Well, there's only one previously before Jordan Lewis. Uh, for us, but there had been about five or six who had played their 300th against us. And until Jordan Lewis, everyone who had been involved in a 300th game uh, against or with us had featured in a loss. Uh, well, their team had lost. Um, yeah. Well, we, we ruined, court. was it Corey Enright who we ruined? Yep, in Geelong. Apart when we when won there a couple of years ago. Yes, that, so that's that, that was a good night because Channel Nine put, had a, uh, a thing on their news saying Geelong defeats Melbourne at Cadinia Park because they'd obviously done it. <laughs> they'd done a pre-record. It's just a copy paste. Mummy bastards! <laughs> I've got a, I've got a screenshot of that somewhere <laughs> to, to wave around uh, at, at any opportunity if if I ever need to bag Channel Nine. Bag Channel Nine or just uh, make fun of Geelong? I don't know. Or just <laughs> know celebrate the fact that we, yeah we won a game at Cadinia Park. Yeah, either or. Um, so, uh, AFL Coaches Awards, um, Maxi and Clary cleaned up again. Um, Maxi reta- was, uh, not sure if he took back or was retaining top spot, but he is top spot and Clary, uh, is now in fifth. Um, no other team has two in the top five, so it's pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to quibble with uh, two highly paid professional coaches, but um, I didn't think Gorn. I know he had a lot of hit outs and he was very pivotal in the second quarter, but I, I personally didn't have him amongst our best players for the night. Um, but again, I defer to the the guys who do this for a living, um, and I'm very pleased pleased to see him get votes. Um, just on the coaches' award, do you reckon? Um, do you reckon Goody and I guess? all the other coaches in the AFL, it's them sitting down and doing it? Or do you think they handball it off to one of the assistants? I'd like to think it is them. Like you just like, it's like, you know, when you're a kid and you're watching the wrestling, you'd like to think it's real, <laughs> uh, but you might be just a bit suspect that somewhere they're just, yeah, going, can you fill this out for me? Um, speaking of coaches, oh, I'd just like to highlight one of the, uh, the greatest yes. things I've ever seen. Uh, in the coach's box after the game um, when Goody went wild, fair enough too, and he gave uh, AFLX Premiership coach Craig Jennings a, a playful whack over the head and Craig just gave him nothing. Well, He just he, he just kept staring for it. It was one of the funniest things. I've, I've watched it about 75 times uh, in the last week because it just amuses me every time. Now, what do you think that was all about? Um so I said, like, you, you posted that video on uh, Twitter. I replied saying it was a visual representation of uh, Grape Viney, our other co-host who uh, could make it this week, uh, giving me an I told you so, you know, keep the faith type of thing. Do you, th- yeah. do you think there was something like that going on there? Like he slapped him sort of saying, see, I told you so. Maybe he had been a negative Nancy in the box or something. Even, he didn't even have the emotion before Goody got to him, though. He was just staring. Oh, like, stone cold. Head ahead. Yeah. Like, he was just in the zone. Like, he's my new favourite off-field <laughs> character now. He's like, you know, in some ninja, um, you know, psychological stance, just watching the game. Well, they, s- they say he's the mastermind, and I always get a bit um, I get a bit of post-traumatic stress when I hear the mastermind because we had a <laughs> coach come over from another club who was supposed to have been the mastermind 
of a uh, of a premiership. Uh, but yes. Well, he's won an AFL X premiership. Yes, he is a he as, is a premiership coach. coach. So him and Jake Melksham, the, the greatest AFL X duo of all time. <laughs> um, I like one of the uh, one of the theories I saw on Twitter was that uh, he wasn't happy that uh, we'd sludged out the game, which I, I don't think is an appropriate uh, appropriate uh, conspiracy theory, because um, I'm sure he would have been extremely happy uh, that we won. But if he was extremely happy that we were one, he certainly was not displaying it. So oh, I'd really just like to, uh, I'd just like to to hear more from Stone Cold Craig Jennings because uh, he's he's definitely gone up in my estimation uh, after that performance. We might have to try and get him on the on the program. Um... You should, and then you should like whack him behind the head and just see what happens. <laughs> Do a video. <laughs> Gee, I was, I'm glad he wasn't on when I uh, was having my like, technological issues. He might have come around to my house and, buddy, yeah, like uh, me a kicking. Maybe we'll turn it into an ice bucket challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we've got in the chat room, Jennings was quiet after T-Max Stunner at West Coast last year too, which makes one of us because I was on the floor of my living room screaming at the top of my mind. Yeah, I, I when I had a similar reaction when uh, T Mac kicked that goal as I did when um, uh, Nibbler kicked the goal. Uh, uh, <laughs> it was it was that piece of play. That was a really nice uh, piece of play. Uh, if you've seen the, I think I've got it going uh, on a loop on the front page of Demonland dot com. Um, from the ball up, uh, Nibbler's there in that piece of play at the ball up and he just runs from that, you know, half back line all the way down the ground, followed the ball all the way down, got went to Jesse was in a great um uh one on one contest, uh which he won. Um and then the handball over to um to Petraka who got it to Nibbler. That was a fantastic piece of play. Um play of the night, I thought. <laughs> Well, I guess once it once it got out, they'd uh, committed so many people forward that once Hogan beat the bloke, that was uh, that was it. Um, it was funny that they they sort of persisted for a long time with our old mate Kyle Cheney, uh, yes. sort of sitting as a loose man in defence, even in the last two or three minutes. Um, I guess they were just in the hope that uh, we weren't going to nick one going the other way, and that they could get one, which they should have uh, if if bets hadn't had that uh, that brain fade and put it into the post. Um, but I guess what were the... What, we drafted Tom McDonald with the pick we traded Kyle Cheney to Hawthorne for, so what were the odds that uh, seven or eight years later they'd be playing on each other uh, in a back line a, as a defender and a forward um, all these years later? A few people must have gone, geez, Kyle Cheney, is he still a lot? Well, uh, it's funny that you say that because I had to look up to see when he started his career, which it turns out was 2008. I, for some reason, I thought, has he been around since like 1998? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's his, well, hair, he, his haircut. He's got a he's... quite a uh, historical <laughs> position in the world of Demon Blog because I think, I think he's the only man ever to get five votes on debut. <laughs> uh, it was round one, 2009 against North Melbourne, same day that... I think we had about five debutants. It was like him, Jetta, Bennell, Jake Spencer, somebody else, all debuted on the same day. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it suffice to say there wasn't a massive amount of uh, people to select from. So so Kyle became the, the first man, and I think the last, to ever get the full five votes on debut. I think Michael Evans might have got four on debut. Uh, so as you can see, getting... Uh, Big votes on debut is not necessarily conducive to a long and successful career at the Melbourne Football Club. No, it's not. Um, also, uh, good for Kyle though. He's still going, still trading on it. Ten years later, continuing his AFL career. I see his nickname is Feta, and I'd like to get the story behind that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we won't got a lead just, on Kyle Cheney. Surely it's because Chi Chi is like cheese. Cheese, yeah, well, that's it. Yeah. No, no, no. That's the only thing I can think of, <laughs> but maybe maybe there's something sinister, John Longmire horse style to it. Maybe he just likes uh, Greek food. Um, uh, moving on, do you ever um, uh, take a peek over the fence? And what I mean, do you ever, uh, after the game, go over to the you know opposition message boards, uh, whether it's through Big Footy or um, I don't know. I'm sure there are other there are 
standalone demon lands <laughs> for other clubs. Um, I personally don't um, because I, I know what it's like uh, when we have a loss. Um, they need opposition trolls yeah, yeah. coming. But but uh, someone, every now and again, someone will post a thread on Demonland with just the best of of what they're saying on the other clubs. Uh, do, you, do you ever go and no, look at the look, train I wrecks of other clubs? I, I can't... Uh... I can't bring myself to... Uh, I just don't care what other people have got to say, even when they're melting down. Though I did find the collection that was put together uh, together on that Demonland thread to be quite amusing, which um, it really looked like a post-Melbourne loss thread where you could just change the names. <laughs> yeah. It was like, Zach the captain, the coach is no good, we need to do this, we need to make this change. It was, you know, it's probably interchangeable across... I'd say 18 supporter groups, but I, su- I suspect there might be a couple of them that uh, don't have enough fans to, to do that kind of thing. But across most supporter groups that you could pretty much plug and play, uh, the same collection of uh, whinges after a disappointing loss as the one we saw on the, the post. But what what tends to happen, uh, they, you know, they go into complete meltdown like we do. Um, you know, we're not immune to this, obviously. We've had 10 years of it. Um, but they all uh, insult Melbourne in the process by saying, how could we lose to them? They're no good. Uh, we sort of get uh, cop, cop, cop a few whacks uh, along with it. <laughs> I suppose the Adelaide fans have got an extra reason to be uh, distressed because every time that we win, it's stuffing their draft position up. Yes. Uh, so in this case, even worse, we, we push away from them. In We take the four and they don't get the four and we, we push away from them that's a little bit more. So here's hoping we uh, obviously finish as high as possible to really screw them over. Uh, I'd like to be handing them pick 18 at the end of the year, if, if at all possible. Well, I like to... I, I was happy we beat Adelaide twice this year. Um, one, because of the the sads that um, Taylor Walker cracked when uh, Jakey Lever <laughs> defected. Uh, and then also just uh, for... I, I'm not sure if you read uh, a lot of the comments on Twitter when Jake Lever went down with a knee injury. Some of those uh, Adelaide fans were, were quite vicious uh, in their glee over, uh, you know, someone... Uh, you know, doing it, doing a knee and uh, missing the rest of the year. Um, yeah, even I wasn't classless enough to uh, do such a thing when uh, our old friend Tom Scully was injured earlier in the year. So there's certainly a line. I'm, I'm more than happy for Crows fans to uh, to go troppo in general about uh, about a player leaving. That's their right, and that's why I don't feel. Uh, in any way conflicted, still hating Tom Scully because I welcome Adelaide fans having their right to uh, dislike Lever. But when you tip it that extra step into, you know, cheerleading someone doing themselves a serious injury, then eh, time to time to reinvestigate where you're at in life. Actually, uh, you just reminded me about Scully, so I take back my last uh, comment. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> But that's the thing, like, you get accused of hypocrisy when you hang shit on Scully now, because people are like, oh, what about Lever? What about, well, A, he went, came for a, he came for a trade. He didn't just, like, leg it out the door at the first available opportunity, yeah. and we just happened to get compensation. But B, again, who's, who's saying don't get upset, Adelaide fans, or, you know, when Mitch Clark came, and oh, you got you took Mitch Clark. Who's saying Brisbane fans don't get upset? Like, bring it on. I was originally going to go to this Adelaide game just because I wanted to be there for the the carnival of hate atmosphere to see what it was like. And then obviously when, when Lever did his knee and we started wobbling a bit, I, I chickened out to, to my detriment as it turned out. Um, but, you know, I think it's great. Like, no one's ever done a better carnival of hate than the day we did when Scully first played against us. The The sheer comedy value that our fans put out that day has never been topped. Uh, and I, I suspect the, the Crows fans wouldn't have been able to provide such a uh, comedic experience themselves. It probably would have been uh, a bit Virginia Park, people getting kicked in the head again. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, they would have been able to come up with that, that money bags routine. That's a, that's a classic. Correct. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about how that guy had to go to a, a wedding at, 
like a Scully family wedding, like two weeks later. No, but please, uh, so, please. So, so, so he comes to the game and he's got these big money bags. And I think I'm sure everyone's seen the photo. Yes. And mm-hmm. he says, "Geez, I hope I don't get, I hope I don't get caught on camera." I thought, well, why? We've Isn't got that all, the whole like, point? Yeah, I know, but in in two weeks' time, I have to go to a wedding of one of the Scully cousins or something. It was a very close to the to the inner circle of part of that family. Uh, and then the very first thing on Channel 7's coverage that day is him shaking the money bags. And uh, it's just when I got home and, and sat down to watch the replay, um, which also at one point showed me wearing a Mexican wrestling mask, <laughs> uh, the very first thing was, was this guy shaking the money bags. So uh, I just, I always wondered how he went at the wedding oh, so you a don't couple ha- of weeks later. You don't have the follow-up story <laughs> to that? No, I don't. I don't, actually. <laughs> I wish I did. I should ask. I actually do. He's, he's a Facebook friend of mine, that guy. So I should ask him one day how the wedding went. If he got glassed in the, uh, you know, halfway through the reception or something by a, a mysterious assailant. Well, we might uh, we might need to get get him on the show one week. Get him on. <laughs> Maybe. I'd like to say all the people, like the guy, who, the guy who held up the Judas Thirty One banner that I was <laughs> on the other end of, which I still have uh, in my collection now. He generously allowed me to to keep that at the end of the day. So that's the jewel in the crown of my Melbourne Football Club memorabilia collection. Well, you could get uh, either one or both of the uh, money bags uh, and get the set. Uh, yeah, you'd be... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> True that in the day as well. Yeah, disappointment. I, I just wasn't thinking straight. Um, uh, Jesse Hogan, um, did, you, did you get the feeling that, uh, I mean, he looked, looked a little bit uh, injured. Um, you know, he was in the hands of the trainers at uh, sort of three-quarter time and, you know, they were saying knee, groin, ankle. I mean, there were a few different things, but he, he did look a bit out of sorts to me. Yeah, I, I, I thought ankle. Um, and then he, he kind of went out in that contest and got bumped and that didn't help him either. Um, yeah, I, I thought even before he was in the hands of the trainers that he just looked... Look like he was struggling, um, so I guess if we've if we've got to this point of the week and we haven't had the the mysterious injury where he's got to miss one week, the it's only Gold Coast injury, um, we must be pretty sure he's he's good to go. Uh, but it's certainly certainly concerning. Yeah, well, I'd hate there to be some ongoing niggly thing that we didn't sort of give him a rest. Uh, forget the, the the Gold Coast thing or not. Um, if there is something wrong, I'd prefer to him to miss now than yeah, than later on. Absolutely. But, but I don't know. I, yeah. I don't think they would risk um, something with him. So perhaps there is nothing. But uh, he definitely. Yeah, I think if he plays this week, we've got we've we've got to be pretty sure that there's nothing uh, seriously wrong. You know, I guess players play bumped up and and you know with with a few minor injuries throughout the year. Um, but if he plays this week, we've got to take their word for it that there's nothing major wrong. Um, there was the oops uh, thread of the week. I'm not sure if you're you're aware of um, of this that that occurred on Demon I Land did, yeah. during. You did or you didn't? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh, you did. So it was actually during the game by uh, by a poster who's been around for a long time, uh, Dazzle Davy. Um, he posted that. Uh, um, you know, he was uh, sick of uh, a nibbler. He's absolutely killing all of our chances of trying to win this game. Uh, and then, you know, had egg on his face, uh, I think, uh, a bit later in the game when nibbler sealed the game. Yeah. Um, we, we've all been there, I oh, think. Uh, I've been there many point, times. We've, we've gone early. Uh, I had one Queen's birthday last year. Uh, I think maybe at half time we were... God knows how far behind, but we were certainly not playing particularly well. And uh, I went off on one on Twitter, and then a few, a few loonies who I who must have seen it retweeted by somebody else came. You know, oh, you, you know, we won, support the team, all this kind of stuff. And it's like, just you know, just chill out. We all lose the plot at certain times, uh, and you know, when it's a situation like this, we're very happy to be proven right. Well, which I think is why it's sometimes it's easier to be negative because at least if you're wrong, you'll still be happy. Whereas if you come in sunshine and rainbows uh, and it all goes wrong, you're left with nothing and you were wrong. 
Well, I had someone write to me on on Facebook through the Demonland Facebook page, which you can find us uh, uh, facebook dot com slash Demonland thirty one. I had someone write to me saying, "Oh, based on uh, my <laughs> emotional uh, 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 monologue at the beginning of last week's show, um, saying." I can't believe you've got no faith in the team, uh, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I, I wrote back to him, I said, I think you missed the whole point of it. I was just saying how much that loss hurt me. Like I said, I know we've got the talent, but I it, does, it was more about my disappointment of the game and how much it hurt me. And, uh, it, you know, it was the second well, time in a we, long, long time. A, can we get a rundown of what exactly the club has done in the last 10 years plus? <laughs> that uh, indicates that you should have faith in them. Like, <laughs> I have faith we're heading in the right direction and the fact, the fact that we have the best list we've had, you know, since maybe 2002. Mm. But at the same time, there's a lot of trust to be won back uh, before, you know, we, we go and start assuming automatically we're going to go places. Uh, and I think when you have a situation like the Geelong game where we get knifed at the last minute, um, you know, there's, it's no surprise that people have an emotional reaction to that. So the idea that you should just blindly walk into battle without even thinking about it and just support everything that moves in a Melbourne jumper uh, is a bit uh, sunshine and lollipops for my liking. I think yeah, there's, there always has to be a fair degree of scepticism until you've been uh, given the evidence otherwise. Um, we've got a caller. Uh, don't make me angry. How are you? Good, how are you guys going? Oh, going really well, mate. Um, you know, especially after a win, uh, much better than I was last week after the loss when uh, I was ready to get the knives out. Oh, mate, you know, if we'd beaten Geelong last week, the week before, Geelong was not going to make the finals. We would have knocked them out of the top eight permanently. Oh, oh mate, I'm well aware of that. Uh uh, I don't know if you didn't listen a couple of weeks ago. I've got a bet going on with my nephews. Uh, they're Ge- massive Geelong fans, and um, the bet is who finishes higher at the end of the home and away season. And despite the fact that we're currently on top of them now, um, I don't know. I, I, I I'm co- more confident now that we'll make the finals, but I'm not confident that we're going to finish higher than Geelong. At the moment, um, so yeah, that really disappoints me because had we beaten them, um, I would have been home and hosed, I reckon, with that bet. They've certainly got a, a slightly easier run home than we have. They've got Fremantle and Gold Coast yeah. at home, so they've got two wins. So. I've got no doubt about that. They've got two wins that they can talk, chalk up now, possibly by outrageous margins. Yes, especially the Gold Coast one. And and, and Fremantle. If they're, they're chasing percentage. Yeah. yeah, if they're chasing percentage in the last two rounds, yeah. uh, we we would hopefully, I I'm, suspect we wouldn't be the ones playing against them. Um, it's probably likely to be more North Melbourne and Sydney, North Melbourne or Sydney going against them. Um, but yeah, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to have to rely on Frio or Gold Coast putting in yeah, at Cadinia Park in the last two rounds. Oh, definitely not. Uh, who else do they have? They've got Hawthorne and Richmond. So I, I, yeah. I actually think so they hopefully might... Hopefully they lose the next... Well, hopefully they lose this week. And then Hawthorne, I guess that's one where we're going to have to decide after this week what the uh, lesser of two evils would be there. I, I actually think Geelong might knock off Richmond. Uh, funny, funny, funnily now enough. that they've now that Richmond's pinched our record yes. for the most wins in a row at the G, they'll just they'll just ch- chuck one now. That'd be right. Yeah, but don't make me angry. <laughs> Sorry, we've uh, we've ignored you. Uh, what did you call up to say? Just about... oh no, but you never would have beaten Geelong. They'd still be saying, "Oh, but Melbourne hasn't beat any any side in the top eight yet." Well, you know, they keep imagining them saying that, but when we actually beat Adelaide by 91 points, they're actually fourth on the ladder. But so, somehow they always manipulate it to make it. I know you're not it, it, whatever position they are at the time that they want to say it, and except the time when you actually play them, you know that. And um, if Collingwood beat Sydney, and then we beat Sydney, you know they're going to say again, <laughs> "Oh, they still haven't beaten the top eight side, though." 
Yeah, they'll, yeah. they'll say that the Sydney won't be top eight by then, will they? That, that's true. I can see both sides of the coin uh, with that statement. Um, I see what you're saying. It, it does make sense. But, uh, I mean, what do you think? If, if, we, um, if we miss out on the finals, just say we win the one this week and then lose the next three and don't make the finals, uh, what do you think? If we haven't beaten a top eight team, do we really deserve to be there? Well, if we miss out on top eight, that means that um, North Melbourne or Essendon would, would make the eight, uh, and then we've beaten. Both oh yeah, that's them. true. So that, that, you know, <laughs> but if they both, if we make the eight, and they both make the eight, and they're going to say, "Oh, hang on, they did beat sides in the oh, eight. You know what go. I mean? It's, it's convenient to say when it is when you've played them. Oh, you haven't beaten anybody in top eight, but uh, you know. Um, but if we don't make the finals, I tell you what. Um, it, it, you know, we might never make it. I don't, I don't know that sounds drastic, but it could be just a psyche that can never be broken. And then it doesn't take much for good players to all of a sudden go backwards. Mm. Uh, I, you know, Oliver can't, it definitely can't go backwards. But then, you, then again, he did not make a couple of finals. And then, you, and then players, then all of a sudden Petrarca becomes, uh, you know, it, it becomes a Colin Sylvia. And things like that, you know. Um, so when you're talking but, psyche, are you talking the psyche of the players? Is it the fact that they have had two years where they've missed out on the finals by tiniest of margins? Uh, or are you talking about the psyche of the club in general over the last 15 years? Because, you know, when we spoke to um, Paul Ruse, you know, he sort of made the point of guys like Christian Petrarca and, you know, Clary... They don't know about the last ten years, um, you know. So it does yeah, that doesn't affect them. But I guess two years in a row of having just missed the finals uh, could, um, you know, could play on their minds. Well, you know, because what I'm saying is, then you then you never know because they come, um, they might not make the finals, and then Oliver might do a knee, and he might do three knees, and Petrarca might do another knee. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, your chance is gone. You know what I mean? That can easily happen in footy, where you can all of a sudden have a couple of injuries, and you could be you could um, be gone. And um, I think I, I, I definitely don't see it happening. But I tell you what, we just have to make the finals this year. It can't. It's, a, it's not. It's a non-negotiable. Uh, and I, I think um, hopefully Kennedy is going to be out for, <laughs> until the final. And if Kennedy doesn't play, then West Coast are just um, easy. They can't. They can't win without Kennedy. We'll beat them without Kennedy. That I reckon that's almost a given that we'll beat them without Kennedy because their whole game plan is just kick it long to Kennedy. I was at the game, uh, Collingwood West Coast game, and that's pretty much when they started getting on top is when they just started kicking long to Kennedy. And if he's not there, they haven't got that. Um, and without Nata Nui, I think West Coast are prime. And Sydney, Sydney have to pull the trigger with um, Buddy. I reckon they're actually worse off with Buddy in the side at the moment because he's injured. You can tell that he's injured. And in a way, I hope they keep him in the side because I reckon they'll be more beatable with Buddy. It's hard as it to believe, but when a man like him is injured, he's been proven not to play well with injury. You know, like in the grand final, they lost the Bulldogs. They lost that game because he hurt his ankle in the first quarter. And they lost that game because they can't... Buddy doesn't play well injured. Do you guys agree with that or...? Super Picardo, you certainly probably see a lot more footy than I do. Um, oh, but, uh, I look. I can't say that I uh, take as much uh, take enough interest in the Swans uh, to, to say whether that's right one or the other. So I'll take your word for it. Uh, but I can certainly see, you know, a benefit to him just being pushed up the ground, uh, well away from where he can do any damage, um, and hopefully, you know, not having any other, uh, you know, not having any other options down there that we might be able to to keep their score down, even if we haven't got Hibbard back. Um, I thought the back line did a really good job last week. They were under underrated job in those first three quarters, probably the, the first one, first half of the first quarter, not so great. But, you know, Walker got one goal from a free and Lynch didn't get any and Jenkins didn't get any. Um, so I think they, they did a really good underrated job, but I'm still concerned at that back line without, obviously, Lever, but without Hibbert as well. So, yeah, the, the more we can keep the big guns like uh, Kennedy and, and Franklin at bay, the better. Um, but, uh, but I'm very much assuming Jack Darling will uh, take us to the cleaners just to rub it in yet again that we didn't uh, draft him over <laughs> Lucas Cook. 
several years ago. Anything else? Uh, uh, don't don't make me angry. Oh, just talking about Lucas Cook. He's a strange character with the uh, Lucas Cook. His last year, I remember earlier in the year, in that year that he got delisted. Um, early in the year in the VFL, he was kicking bags of four, five. You know, he was kicking regularly bags of goals. He was kicking four and five and six for about four, or five weeks in a row. And then all of a sudden, halfway through that year, he just something must have happened, and he stopped. Um, and then he all of a sudden wasn't kicking any goals in the VFL. Um, I reckon he might have been able to make it. Maybe if they could have given him time, I don't know. Because I remember people calling for a uh, release. Um, uh, released the Cookie Monster earlier in that year, and then by by the second part of the year, everybody's saying they list him. So I don't know. Was something drastic happened with that Lucas Cook, and and who knows? And Darling, you know, we still we should have picked Darling, but then again, he's a WA boy. He might have gone home. And um, they've done a good number with Darling, didn't they? And he's drafted. They said don't draft him. He's a bad kid. He's really bad. So yeah, they put the they, they put the stories in the media. Bad. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead, Super Mercado. Oh no, I was going to say they did a great job in uh, doing a few political style leaks uh, into the media uh, about Jack Darling that scared everyone else off. I've also, I've just to go back to your point about Lucas Cookie. I've had a look at the, I've just pulled up the VFL, and it was 2012. I mean, really, could you not get a game in our forward line in 2012? <laughs> he kicked seven goals over two weeks in the middle of the season. Uh, and yeah, that's got a couple of few weeks later, but after that, barely kicked a barely kicked a goal for the rest of the season. Um, interestingly enough, in round two that year, Tom McDonald kicked three, so there's an early uh, there you go. an early vision of him as a forward. Uh, I was watching the uh, all the goals uh, highlights package that uh, the D's put on um, uh, their YouTube channel and. Um, He's kicking for goal uh, on the run uh, in particular um, is superb, very straight. His first goal was when he was running at full pelt from the 50 yep. and kicked it from about 40, 35, 40 out. Um, that went straight as an arrow. And for a guy that, you know, kicking out of the back line at times, you know, sometimes couldn't hit the side of a barn, he's kicking for goal. Um, and I know it's a different sort of style when you're on the run to when you're, you know, his set shots are very sort of like robotic and quite straight, but it's a whole other story when you're on the run. So uh, I was quite impressed with a couple of his on the run goals he's kicked this year. That goal as well, um, and it was a very good kick by Neil Bullen from the boundary line, but I was very impressed at the way Garlett protected that mark in the middle of the ground. How he sort of turned his body to to make sure he could take the mark and then just played on straight to McDonald. I thought that was a a beautifully constructed goal between those three players. Uh, Speaking of uh, uh, Jeffy Garlett and our small brigade, how do you think uh, they went? I was was happy that... um, Finally, uh, Jay Kennedy Harris was able to get that goal because that's what he's in there for, to get those snaps. And uh, he missed a, missed one the week before, so I was happy with that. Um, you know, um, Jeffrey Garlett um, got he got on the scoreboard, but I think we need a bit more um, a bit more scoreboard pressure from those guys. Uh, Jeffy kicked uh, one goal too, and there was. Uh, one of the goals he missed wasn't an easy one, but he's kicked a lot of those before. Sort of that sort of dribble kick from the from the boundary. It's a it's a tough one, but he's done it before, and that's what we really need him to do. But um, yeah, I don't know, you guys. What did you think of this? The mosquito fleet, uh, Harris, Garlet, uh, Spargo. Well, if I can go back to the very first thing that was put in the chat room tonight about. David King on AFL 360 highlighted Jay Kennedy Harris's work rate and success as a negating half-forward flank. So quite interesting point. I didn't see the program myself, but I'll be interested to actually see um, that analysis of his game because I certainly didn't think he was he was bad by any stretch of the imagination, but it just it's just wondering if from the, from the naked eye, the uncultured eye, thinking, is he giving enough... What does he mean by negating... Neg- ...going to the finals? What does he mean by negator? Well, I guess a, a defensive forward almost yeah. to to tag out their uh, to almost uh, in a way tag out their runners out of the back line. 
uh, a position we've tried several players over the years in uh, with success. I used to sort of think of it as the career graveyard because you had James Magner about 10 games into his first season. He suddenly ended up as a forward and he never went anywhere again. And Luke Tapscott eventually ended up playing that role. I think that was something Dunn did a lot and they used you know, your Rowan Bales, your Matt Joneses, people like that kind of got put down there as that defensive forward. Um, so I'll certainly be interested to see David King and uh, his analysis of that, even though he's the guy who three quarters of the way through last year told us to stop worrying and enjoy the ride. <laughs> and what have Melbourne fans got to worry about? So I, I could give him a list. <laughs> uh, don't make me angry. Anything else um, you want to bring up? I was just going on a bit. Jay Kennedy Harris. I kept on hearing on the site um, people say that he's slow. People say, oh, Jay Kennedy Harris is slow, he's slow, he's slow. But I think somebody pointed out during the game against Adelaide, he had the third fastest sprint time in the um, in the game. So there's perception that people think people are slow. Cause it's, and I think it's absolutely totally wrong that everybody goes, oh, Melbourne hasn't got leg speed. But we've actually got a lot of quick players because um, Brayshaw is fast. Um, Oliver is quick. Viney, when he's playing, is actually very quick. But for some reason, people think that those three players are slow just because they're inside bulls when they're actually very quick players. And with Jay Kennedy Harris, he's obviously quick, but somehow people think that he's slow. But, um, no, and, uh, you know, so what do you think? Uh, people always say we've got slow leg speed, but I think, you know, leg speed is overrated, but also... With leg speed, it's more about mind speed is more important than leg speed. Because remember a bloke called Bell that used to play for us? He was the quickest in the team, but did you ever see him play quick? He was slow in the mind, but he was quick in the feet. But if you're slow in the mind, you can't be quick in your feet. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think, leg speed. I, yeah I think I know what you mean. Uh, but uh, I'll put my hand up and say that I thought that Jay Kennedy Harris uh, looked slow. I think it was the game that, uh, the last game that I went to uh, before the two away games we've had, uh, just in terms of uh, either chasing someone or being chased down, I, I just assumed he was quicker than he was. Um, but I don't know, I guess if you say that his um, sprint numbers are, were, were quite high up, um, then yeah, well, I'll have to, I'll have to uh, keep a closer eye on him the, uh, the next game. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing about leg speed. Oh, that's what I said. It's, if you don't quick, if you don't think quick, you can't play quick. You can run quick, but you can't think quick. But um, another bloke that's really quick, but uh, what's his name? Frost. Uh, the bloke just can't hit a target by foot. Every time he kicks it, it's either a, becomes a neutral situation or it's uh, turned over. And um, I know Joe Boy, when he does his three-word analysis, he's always pumping up... Um, Frost that he's always putting Omac down. It's like Omac's played been uh, loose and unconvincing when he's played really well, and he goes, um, Frost has been strong, bold, uh, and confident when he's been strong, but not very confident whenever he kicks. You know what I mean? But um, I think he just shouldn't. Uh, uh, Frost, he should run, and once he runs, just handball. Never kick. He should never kick. He should just ha- take off like he does, but then handball it off to somebody. I think it'd be better off if he doesn't um, just doesn't kick, just just handball it away because I think that's a lot more safer option for him, just to handball it because if he's closing down speed. And um, we talk about that game against St Kilda. We lost that game because they dropped Bernie Spence for being too slow in the back line. But against the St Kilda game, they didn't bring anybody quick into the side to actually replace Spence, and that's why we lost. And if Frost, no doubt, if he played that game, he would have he probably would have saved two or three goals from that St Kilda got because our back line had no speed in it. You know, we, last year we had the fastest back line and this year we're playing the slowest back line with Hunt and Frost out of the side. Hmm. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. I think Frost, you have, you have to wear some of the yep. the wacky disposals um, just because of the, the fact that he's really the, the only defender we've got who's going to closing, has closing speed to... Uh, you know, take the intercept marks and, and, you know, run onto people when there's a bit of space between them. Um, but, yeah, you're right. Like I think I said in the blog this week, he's like a, he's like a circus animal, let loose. He just, he just runs and just, just you never know what's going to happen after that. 
Uh, and then, of course, when he sort of tried to tried to run through their defence at the end of the game and got pinged for holding the ball, I was letting uh, letting rip with a few choice words about his defence then. But oh, look, I think overall for where our defence is at, without Lever, and especially without Hibbert as well, without both of them, um, I'm prepared to wear the odd loose kick from Frost um, to make up to, to, for whatever else we get from him. You happy with that? Uh, don't make me angry. Yeah, but no, I'm happy with that. Um, but uh, you know, with the problem with Donald's kicking, they're saying he's very good kick for goal. I don't. I think he his kicking has always been good, even in the back line. But it's not about his kicking; it's about his decision making. Decision making, I think making yeah. He turns over the ball a bit in the back line, not because he can't kick, but because he actually he's actually a risk taker, and he takes risks that um are you know that he shouldn't be taking. That's what he he might rate himself a bit high, and he takes those risks. And that's more why he turns it over because he's a very high risk taker. And when he did play in the back line, they were, they were very high reward. But then again, they were very um, high um, punishments as well. When he did, when they didn't come off, they normally were a turnover goal. But when they did come off, they were spectacular sort of plays. But um, but he's but I'm glad now he's in the forward line and uh, he's really worked in his kicking for goal because early in his career he couldn't really kick for goal either. But now he's fixed that up. Um, I think. I think if he has a full season next year, he might. He might be the next person to kick a hundred goals. I think from McDonald. I think he is the is the one capable. They changed the rules a bit. I think he's the capable. The next capable man of scoring, uh, kicking a hundred goals. So what's he kicked this year? He's kicked forty in thirteen games. I think he's played. Um, yeah. Yeah, give him an, give him another ten. Uh, I don't know if he'd kick if he'd kick a hundred, but and I don't know if m- many players would uh, anymore would kick a hundred goals. But um, he'll get. Uh, what do we think about Oscar's shot on goal in the last quarter? Do you think there's any hope for him to uh, do the surprise conversion that uh, Tom's done? Well, didn't you say that he pl- was it you that said he played as a forward in his uh, junior junior years? Uh, I know Tom did. Tom did, but uh, it doesn't look like Oscar did by the uh, by that set shot that he had. <laughs> I mean, you know, wet ball and all that. It wasn't. It was hardly the uh, hardly the right time. No, <laughs> for him to be uh, debuting as a as a forward. Uh, I think he's about four games short of where Tom was before he kicked his first goal. So there's still hope for him yet. Well, uh, Ben Brown's kicked uh, 53 goals this year uh, with five more games. Um, under his belt than um, than Tom, um, so it's possible if uh, Tom gets a, a full year under his belt, he he, he could uh, at least get the Coleman uh, medal. Well, he's he's yeah. up to an average of half a goal a game now in his career after not kicking one for the first fifty nine <laughs> games. So, party at mine when he goes over the uh, one a game average. All right, well we'll hold you to that. <laughs> Uh, anything else? Uh, don't make me angry. Uh, what, what are your changes for this uh, this week? Uh, well, we come, um, Milkshin's out, so yep. Hannon, uh, Hannon's got an injury too, so he can't come in. Well, he can. So they, they, they said he might be available. Uh, yeah, he's the only obvious sort of like-for-like like like sort of a player. What, that, what about Vanders? Or is it too early to bring him in? Yeah, it could, it could be too early, but... Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe it isn't too early because it is. Look, you might say, "Oh, you know, it could be a danger game with Gold Coast," but don't worry about the Gold Coast. They, Stephen May's not playing as well, and Lynch isn't playing. I wouldn't be worried about Gold Coast pulling up an upset. They had their, they had their grand final when they beat Sydney, and I think they're pretty much satisfied with that, and that's probably why they got absolutely smashed by Carlton. So, you know, that, that's their one good performance at Gold Coast. Oh, you would, I wouldn't be worried. They might, they could possibly run us close, but they won't beat us. But I think we'll beat them quite comfortably. And um, yeah, but uh, Omac um, with Oscar McDonald, he's actually a very good kick. He, he he's a superb kick. That kick for goal, he must. It's just something played in his mind. You know, he doesn't kick the goal, but he's kicking out of the back line. He does not miss a target, and everybody's criticised him for turning over. But I think people might have. Judged in the same way they judged Tom out of the back line, but no, he's kicking for goal outside, um, kicking not for goal, kicking for out the back line, 
Omac just, I don't think he turns it over very often at all. He doesn't take the risks that Tom takes, but he does hit his targets. He's a lot more, I'd rather him kicking the ball than Frost, but, uh, but, um, yeah, but, so, yeah, I think Hannah might come in for a uh, Milksham or, or maybe Vandenberg. We could bring him in, I guess, uh, being against the Gold Coast. Um, need that ball. I don't know. He could, he could do, he could be our weapon in the finals. Just bring in somebody different or even Hunt. I would like to see Hunt come back in the side. You know, maybe he could come in back in the side too and maybe play him forward. Um, Can I yeah. throw Dean Kent into the mix as well, potentially, uh, oh. to go forward? Yeah, I like uh, I yeah, like probably, I like yeah, yeah. I liked Kent uh, when he played ag- against North. I thought he was very good. Um, I'd like to see him there, a bit of extra pace. Yeah, Kent. Kent. I'm actually thinking about it now. Kent probably would be the perfect replacement for. Um, I sort of forgot him for a second there, but I think I'd if he's available, I'd actually he should come in. Kent should come in for that to play the auction role. And um, Kent is normally very good when he first comes back into the side, so he should perform really, you know what I mean? Whenever he comes back in the side, his first game is always very good. So Kent will be a good replacement for this game and uh, and then maybe even against Sydney. Um, just, uh, yeah. And it's, Sydney, about, yeah we, it's a time where we need to sort of know, is, is, he, is he there to go at the end of the year? So good chance to to give him a run out and just to say either yay or nay for the rest of the year. Well, um, uh, I think it was Wise Blood on uh, Demon Land said um, today after with the Milksham injury, it'll be very telling uh, about the pecking order um, uh, about who comes in because if Vanders gets in with only, I think he's played two games uh, Casey had a bye last week, so no one played this week. But he's played two games. So if he gets in uh, before, say, Bug or um, Kent, um, it says a lot about where Bug and Kent are. Um, and it all just depends on where the Hannons... Yeah, well, <laughs> exactly. Kent so a contract at the end of the year. So you'd want to, uh, you know, if you were him, you'd want to get in and show what you can do. Exactly. It's a last roll of the dice, I think, for a couple of those guys. So, um, yep, if any of them gets a chance and, you know, this is the week they might get their chance, you've got to, uh, like Frosty, Frosty, I reckon, is playing for his, his career every time he, he comes on the on the field now. So, um, you know, there's going to be a few. He's actually contracted till the end of next year as well, which, of course, doesn't mean that uh, doesn't mean that you spend the year well, anywhere other than Casey Fields in some circumstances. Well, there's, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Dick Collingwood now, um, you know, can tell you about playing a year at Casey. Um, yeah. Uh, his name, what's his name? Lyndon Dunn. Lyndon Dunn. There you go. You can, uh, you know, have a year on your contract and you can play out at Casey. So, you know, a few guys playing for for their careers. Um, uh, So, yeah, I guess, you know, Milk, any other changes you think this week? I don't, unless there's other force force changes, do you think anyone might get uh, the chop this week? No, I don't think they're going to get the chop. Not after a win like that. Yeah. The last two weeks have been very good, um, except for just two. We only had two bad quarters that have almost cost us two games. Uh, no one really deserves to get dropped at all. Everybody's played pretty much. Everybody's pretty much played their role and played fairly well. Uh, we've got to reward that. So no other changes. Just just that force change and that that will that, guys. That will be it. That definitely that that's all they will um, change. I don't think anybody's put anybody's put a, had a stinker in the last two weeks to deserve to be dropped. Um, yeah, so no, no more, no, just one, one change and one change only. That's definitely um, possibility. So, all right, yeah. all right. And, so um, you go ahead. Yeah, no. Well, uh, that's that should be the end of me tonight. So um, <laughs> okay. we'll just say um, go, uh, go, D's. Uh, yes. Yes. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, don't make me angry. Always good to hear from fellow Demon Landers. So uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Super Mercado, we'll, we'll end it soon, but we've got a few things I want to just quickly touch on. Uh, the round 23 fixture was announced. Uh, we're playing on the Sunday. No surprises there. 3.20 p.m. It's our, we've, we've, 
We've cornered the market on 3.20 on a Sunday, particularly later in the year. I think we play uh, th- three of our last four games at that time. Um, and possibly, when are we playing on uh, the West Coast games? Is that a Sunday as well? Probably about 4, 4.40 Melbourne time. So, yeah, round about that time. Yeah, not sure. But obviously Channel 7, uh, Channel 7 probably like us because we, we are the, the highest, best scoring team in the competition pretty much. So... Hopefully they'll be, for Channel 7's uh, purposes, they'll be very much hoping that that's a live game uh, that comes down to a pretty much in or out, uh, because if that game's off the agenda and doesn't mean anything, then their ratings will will probably get exactly what you would expect for a uh, Melbourne GWS game that's a dead rubber. Well, I am praying that we've sewn it up by then, because I can't go through what we did last year. Particularly, just say... Yep. Uh, we even, and even worse if we happen to lose. I would prefer if we lost a GWS. It just meant we can't make it and not have to rely on that last game because which is which is going to be so, half halfway through by the time our game finishes. Yes, so I guess that's probably better than what happened last week where we had to wait the day and whatever, so there'd be less uh, less time of misery. Um, but we've got after us is St Kilda, North Melbourne. Now, I if we somehow, for whatever happens, where where if we have to rely on St Kilda either winning or not giving up, giving North Melbourne some percentage, well, shoot me now, because yeah, yeah that will be a a hot afternoon in the MCG with people crowded around televisions. Do uh, Do you reckon they'll play it on the score? The joint. They have to play it on the scoreboard, don't they? Can they? All right, football this year is so tone deaf to what the supporters want. They'll probably roll the security guards through twenty minutes later and say, "Everyone, get out!" <laughs> they don't uh, want and force seats. us all out of the ground. <laughs> they don't want to sta- uh, uh, the Olympic stand burnt down. <laughs> yeah, correct. We, yeah, if they're doing it because they've got a, a leak that there might be some uh, extraordinary scenes of violence afterwards, that's one thing. Um, but yes, I would have thought that uh, it would be the sensible thing to do if required to, uh, if they can, I'm sure they can turn it on the big screen and pray that the G is still standing the next day. Cause but let's hope it doesn't come to that. No, let's hope it doesn't come to that. But the, St Kilda's not win a chance two. to, they're not a chance to win that game. I'll, I'll bet it now. Anyone wants to take a bet with me? I'm not a betting man, but I'll, I'll put any money <laughs> that North Melbourne win that game. But if it also comes down to North Melbourne needing X amount of percentage, that's yep. going to happen as well. <laughs> you can bet. Yeah, absolutely. You can bet your bottom dollar. It'll probably be Ben Brown kicking a goal on the siren as well that puts them <laughs> over their 0.05 percent that they need. Um, yeah, that'll kill me. I, I, I'll, I'll. If anyone wants to buy, purchase uh, deep, the demonland dot com <laughs> after that. <laughs> I'm willing to take uh, take your best offer. Um, uh, do, do we even need to talk about the run home and the ladder predictions and all that? Uh, <laughs> I guess it comes down yeah. to, I mean, with scenario wise, two games does it, or is there still if if we beat Sydney? Yeah, if we beat, I'm talking S- Sydney. So win the next two. Is there any way we can miss it from there? Like, um, there surely is, but I think that, not, that will not by hurt someone Sydney winning by so two hundred, not by someone winning by two hundred points. But is there any way? I came just up with something wins? the other day that I, I came up with a scenario that involved a team with fourteen wins finishing not, finishing ninth. Uh, really, with Sydney finishing ninth on fourteen wins and Hawthorne finishing tenth on thirteen wins. Wow. So, but the good news is in that scenario, we finished sixth with All 14. Right, I'll, I'll take so. that. <laughs> and That's... get Geelong in the finals, which uh, would, would finish the spirit of 2005 uh, discussion we were having last week where we beat them in the thriller and then they thumped us in the finals. So in this case, they would have beat us in the late season thriller and we can thump them in the elimination final. See, I wonder how uh, in that elimination final, were we on top of them or they were on top of us? Uh, we in this case we'd be on top of them. All right, I've factored in us still to be eight percent ahead of them, with 
reasonably hefty wins against uh, Fremantle and Gold Coast, but not, say, uh, sort of, you know, 250-point no, wins no, or something no, no. That, where, where it could go. Because I did scenarios. So I, I'd be very happy with that, but uh, that still factors in us beating GWS in the last game to get to that point. Yeah, I had, uh, I've got the, as I mentioned before, I've got the bet with my nephews, and there was a scenario where we could uh, finish below them, but then play them in the final the next week. So uh, there's that, and then there's that possibility that we beat them in the finals, but then I still ha- lose that bet to them and <laughs> have to wear a Geelong jumper, even though we've won. And, you know, I, I think I'd wear that. Uh, <laughs> you can just make snide comments all day about wearing the Geelong jumper of the team that lost a final to Melbourne. Yes, yeah, so uh, I think I could and take that. And to which they'll probably say, you're wearing the team, the jumper of the team that won the premiership. <laughs> in, uh, uh, so it <laughs> could backfire on you. It could. So, uh, yeah, let's hope Let's hope we, we... I want to win the next two games. We'll take oh, yes. one week at a time. I think that... <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely think that, um, yeah, if we beat Sydney, um, and of course, if Collingwood beat Sydney as well, which you would think they would do, um, that that helps the equation even more. That gives even more of a break. So you, you switch, you put Collingwood beating Sydney, and then Sydney's down to 13 wins. Um, but it just makes our game against them so crucial. Like if the Geelong one was an eight-pointer, this is about a 16-pointer. Um, because it doesn't automatically kill off either team losing that game. Um, the Swans have got GWS, who, again, that could go either way. Uh, and then they've got Hawthorne in the last round, which could go either way. So oh, yeah. I'm sort of starting to feel like a dickhead for punting them home against North uh, a couple of weeks ago, because I thought beating North was the what would help us the most. Um, now North sort of got this easy run for the last few games. Uh, they might not be our our biggest concern. Yeah, it's uh, these ladder predictors. Uh, I'd love to know the AFL stats on how many times it's been uh, it's been used. Um, well, if they'd put it up before about round fifteen, that was the most ridiculous decision of all time. Talk about tone deaf organisations that don't understand what the people want. Give us the ladder predictor from round one. Was that's, there why a... I, that's why I've got an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> with uh, that some genius slash lunatic off the internet created, where you just punch the scores in and it uh, generates the ladder for you. That's why I had to go at about round seven to start tracking my uh, the Bradbury plan for the rest of the year. Well, this this ladder predictor, I think it's up from last. Where it must save um, it must save it in your uh, browser cookies or something. So I've got staring me. In the face, the the ladder where we finished ninth on thirteen wins. <laughs> oh God, I couldn't cope. We've we've already we are we are alongside Richmond as the only, or we would be alongside Richmond as the only team to finish ninth twice since the final eight came in. Uh, but at least they had the good sense to do it about five years apart. So, um, for all the for, for all the the cliches that they get. Uh, we will actually have more of a right to the ninth cliche than they will if we finish there again. So that that is all predicated. That that uh, that ninth um, seems to be predicated on um, Geelong beating Hawthorne. But if Hawthorne beat Geelong, exactly. we we get in. Um, that I've also factored in. You know, North making it on the fourteen wins. Um, uh, but um, yeah, North, yeah, but so, North's just got a, like Brisbane this week is probably the best chance of anyone knocking off North because they've got the Bulldogs who have shut up shop. They've got Adelaide, I suppose. Yeah, that's probably a, a potential as well. Yeah, but, but they shut up by shop. then. They've shut up shop, um, but you never know. You know, Kyle Cheney might have 142 <laughs> intercept marks or something, and Tex Walker has something to prove, etc., etc. So, yeah. w- if they don't lose either of those two, they're not going to lose to. Bulldogs, they're not going to lose to St Kilda. So, you know, there's the potential for them going in on four straight wins to end the season. Um, I do still think there's, you know, it's likely going to come down to the GWS game. Um, but it's, do other people topple over in front of us and make that game irrelevant? That's the question. Yeah, look, I, th- I think it's... Uh... And I'm saying if we win the next... If we win the next two and that's all we win... Um, that Geelong Hawthorne game, I think, is the is the game. 
we need Hawthorne yeah. to knock Geelong yeah. off. Well, I mean, at the moment, we probably want Hawthorne to win, but, but <laughs> you never know. That's going to be such a 50-50, yeah. um, a hard one to, to pick. Like last week, we knew that we wanted West Coast to beat North, and that was a crucial game. Mm. Um, and West Coast are still, we're still waiting for West Coast to show up in Hobart yeah. and have some semblance of a crack. Um, and that's what gives North that hope that now they, they run these last four games that are winnable and they can still fall in. That would have stuffed them if they'd lost that um, with no negative benefit to us unless you uh, unless you think we're going to win all four of the remaining games, which will uh, certainly put us into the top two or three, which would be nice. But I'll just be conservative now and just, uh, just, just work on the eight to start with and anything else will be a bonus. Well, I've I've also just I've done a scenario now where Port miss out on fourteen wins, wouldn't that? <laughs> wouldn't that we also get fourteen yeah. wins in this scenario? Um, that would be nice. It's just the, it's going to be the most bonkers <laughs> run in. Like I'm, I know there's been a lot of you know your, your 1987s and and stuff like that, but in the modern 2000 top eight um, world, it's going to be one of the craziest run ins of all time. And it's just a shame that that's not being celebrated. We're too busy talking about playing with like a Frankenstein golf square in a VFL game um, that I notice has been uh, mysteriously promoted to be the Channel 7 game despite the fact that the teams have got one win and one draw between them. Like, that's what we're focusing on so much at the moment when people should be focusing on this amazing finish to the season. So I, I haven't been paying too much attention to the, the rules. What What is the whole deal with the bigger goal, goal, square, uh, goal square? What's... Like, it's longer, so theoretically, For what you reason? should be able to kick it further down the ground from the kick out. From the kick out, like and that's 10 it. Meters, I think ten meters longer. But how does what does that do? Yeah. You just get the ball. Well, out, you could out. kick it to the left wing. You could kick it to the right wing. It's. I don't understand why you wouldn't just sit everyone back and stack the middle of the ground. But I guess then you you run the risk of the, the dinky short kick you do into the pocket and now becomes the dinky short kick to the 30-metre mark. I don't, I, 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 how does that help? <laughs> it, I, yeah. Well, tune in to Channel 7 at uh, on Saturday afternoon and you'll see the two worst teams in the VFL <laughs> playing a, a trial game, which will probably be held up as all the evidence you need that they're the best rule changes of all time. Um, based on a sample size of one with two absolute shocking teams. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's funny. I wonder what the actual TV game was supposed to be that got the boot uh, for this game it, instead. It, it was. They know people tune in to see these new so rules. Who, who's, the, um, who's playing this week? Because I can tell you. Uh, it's Coburg who have the, yep. the draw when they should have had the win, but the, uh, the poor trainer ran across the mark and yes. gave away the 50 after the siren. And you've got Werribee, who I I believe have won one game. It's, so I, I suspect that wasn't Channel 7's original choice. No, it wasn't. I, I, I heard it, and I was going to say Werribee, but then you said Werribee's the team that's playing. But maybe it's uh, Colling, Collingwood playing Geelong uh, by any chance. Yeah, uh, seems like it. If Collingwood's playing Geelong in the, in the twos, that was the game that was going to be on. I'm just... Uh, yeah. Pulling up my VFL. So now they're uh, they're shifting to the Frankenstein rules, Challenge Cup. Uh, no, July, uh, maybe it's Geelong which, Richmond or Box. I don't know. Uh, either way, they yeah. weren't showing Coburg where. No, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> no, like, no, no, they weren't. That was, that, <laughs> there will be a worse spectacle for football than that game they did at Williamstown, where there was a hurricane blowing across the ground for four quarters and. Sandringham scored none, or the one North Melbourne scored no goals against us. Uh, so the the only possible interest in it is seeing these rule changes, which I reckon about two minutes in of seeing someone kick out of a long goal square and players lining up in a different position at the bounce, everyone will just be like, thank you, I think I'll uh, go outside and tend to my garden. <laughs> well... Um... Yep, yeah, it's going to be an interesting uh, end to the season and um, yeah, hopefully we're going to feature uh, well into September. But uh, let's, as we say, let's take one week at a time. Um, well, I think uh, I think we can end it there, uh, given the technical difficulties we had uh, oh, at the midway point. I apologise again to the audience. 
No, I'm, that's I'm a, that's right. Anyone the, outside and hit my microphone with a garden implement. Anyone who is uh, going to be listening to this on replay is not going to hear any of that because I'm going to. It's going to be God. erased from history. So uh, anyone listening live now, we apologise uh, to all 110 of you who are listening live at the moment. So. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be back uh, next week. Uh, oh, God help us if <laughs> if we're coming back <laughs> of a loss because I don't know if I, I can do the show. To, I volunteer to do the head in the oven monologue at the start <laughs> if we don't win. Well, there you go. I, I will uh, record you uh, uh, doing that. Um, yeah, Great Viney won't be back next week. Uh, uh, due to work commitments, uh, so yeah, it's uh, us flying solo again. <laughs> um, I'll well before well, I'll play the music, but uh, you want to plug your your stuff? Yes, you can always go to uh, demonblog.com dot uh, com or demonwiki dot org for your historical uh, needs, or check us out on Twitter at demonblog or on Facebook at demonblog. Okay, and uh, you can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash demonland31. Find us on Twitter at demonland, um, Instagram, demonland31. Or you can find us at demonland.com. Join up and uh, join the discussion uh, each and every day at, uh, at demonland. Um, and uh, if you want to email us, we now have an email address. Um, that's podcast at demonland.com. If you want to download us on iTunes, if you're listening to this on SoundCloud, de- subscribe and de- uh, on uh, iTunes and leave us a five-star review and maybe I'll read a couple of them out. All right, my name's Andy. That's Super Mercado's been my uh, host, co-host. We'll see you next week. Go Demons. <laughs>